Hello, I'm Christina Davis, Director of the Program on U.S.-Japan Relations, and I'm very happy to welcome you. I hope you all enjoyed spring break and um, the new spring weather that makes it feel like uh, we're ready for the new season. Today we have a wonderful talk. Uh, Richard Katz is joining us. He is the special correspondent for Weekly to Toyo Keizai and the senior fellow at the Carnegie Council for Ethics and International Affairs. Some of us also know his work as the creator of Japan Economy Watch, a substack which provides insightful analysis of the Japanese economy. And we certainly do need insightful analysis because the Japanese economy is difficult to understand. It's sending mixed signals. One can read a report about lack of economic growth that, you know, minus 0.4%, plus 0.4%, it just barely avoided a recession through some uh, changing of the numbers. And with the decline of the value of the yen, Japan's overall uh, size of the economy has fallen to the fourth in the world after Germany. At the same time, you know, we're hearing about the surge of the Nikkei stock market with uh, climbing to the highest point since 1989. We're hearing optimistic news about rising wage levels. And even the New York Times saying maybe Toyota's strategy to invest in hybrids was not so stupid and they're making lots of profits and took the right strategy to the transition away from the combustion engine. So you can easily go from really grim that Japan's economy is continuing in stagnation to a more rosy look that this is, you know, about to see a start off. The old giants are still strong and there's lots of new art start companies uh, ready to take over. So uh, the question matters a lot, not just for those of us who care about Japan, because the news about China is also mixed. The rise of China, uh, the fear about economic collapse in China, either story is a bit worrisome. And so there is hope that Japan's economy growing would show uh, industrial democracy, ally of the United States, could anchor East Asian economy and lead the way as a country committed to free trade and open engagement. Um, so both the United States, Europe, and others are hoping that Japan's economy is moving forward. Well, the question about you know, what lies ahead for Japan's economic future is exactly what Rick has written in this fantastic book, The Contest, Japan's Economic Future. He's looking at entrepreneurs versus corporate giants. The book was just released last year by Oxford University Press, and it looks at this question of entrepreneurship. How have Japan's established institutions, everything from big institutions to many policies to labor market institutions, become a challenge for Japan's economic revival. But at the same time, the book is not just grim. There are stories about where there could be change and recommendations about the types of changes that are necessary to facilitate more flexibility in labor markets an economic policy by the government that just doesn't support the big companies, but also opens room for innovation, open innovation, where partnerships among small companies could lead to more innovation. So it's a great book. It's already winning high praise. Um, our own former associate, who also went on to be former cabinet minister, Heizo Takenaka, praises the book saying, Richard Katz, who knows Japan's economy and society inside and out, offers a book full of careful analysis and bold recommendations. This book also represents the latest in the series of books that Rick has been writing about Japan's economy. Previously, he wrote Japan, the System That Soured, 1998 book. Then in 2023, he wrote, or 2003, he had a book on the Japanese Phoenix. Both of these books are published both in Japanese and in English. And this actually speaks to the unusual ability of Rick to advise those of us in the US or Europe studying Japan, while also being taken very seriously within Japan as a leading expert analyzing the economy. His work appears in the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, as well as, of course, Japanese uh, news publications. Our event today is co-sponsored by the 
Mosavar Ramani Center for Business and Government at the Harvard Kennedy School, as well as Japan Society of Boston. We've asked you to speak for only 30 minutes, which is hard because you spent many years writing the book, but I know there will be many questions. So we look forward to your remarks. I would have 45 minutes worth of words packed into 30 minutes. <laughs> I'm known for speaking too quickly sometimes. So if I am speaking too quickly, just wave your hand and say, slow down. Um, so good morning. Thank you very much. That's a very kind, kind introduction. You know, when I was in college, uh, way back when, uh, all, I, all I knew about Japan was that when my parents bought me a toy and it broke three days later, sure enough, it was made in Japan. That was in 1969. 20 years later, Japan had moved so far in autos and electronics and everything. There were people, lots of Americans who feared that Japan was going to take over the future belonged to Japan. And a professor at this university who went on to become treasury secretary and then president of the university in December of 1989 said that Japan may be a bigger threat to the United States than the Soviet mm -hmm. Union. Can you imagine? Not only was that hysterical, but it, it reflected the tenor of the time. It was also a monument to bad timing because one month after that was published, Japan's stock market crashed. And that was the trigger, not the cause, but the trigger for three decades now, which are lost decades of lack of growth, lack of stagnation. So what will people say 20 years from now? Will Japan be back or will Japan still be stagnant and corroding the fall and everything? That's what this book is about. It's, there's a contest between forces which if successful really would help catalyze recovery and those and those who resist it. So let's let's talk. All right. First of all, the stock rally does not mean Japan is back. So here's the stock market, right? This is GDP. This is 2018. GDP today is no higher than GDP was six years ago. That is not a sign of recovery. Compensation per employee, real compensation adjusted for inflation or deflation, is actually about 5% lower than it was six years ago. Again, this is not a sign of recovery. And what I would argue is that, yeah, <clears throat> is that there are a number of reforms that are necessary to produce a real, a real recovery. And some of those are occurring and some are not. And we're gonna talk about what's, what's happening there. But there are reforms needed in two areas. One is supply, on the supply side, one is on the demand side. Now I have to tell you, I'm an economist and our bylaws and our secret handshakes require me in a half hour talk, I have to say supply and demand at least three or four times. So that's one so far, okay? <laughs> so on the demand side, you got a very basic problem, which is that how will companies produce anything if they can't sell it? Why would they produce it? And if and wages keep falling, who's going to buy the stuff that the manufacturers make? Right? So if I get in your way, let me know, okay? Um, and, and that's the problem in Japan, that economists have figured out for decades now that in order for economies to be stable macroeconomically, that the growth in real wages per worker have to more or less equal over the long-term growth in real output per worker. So what we have here, this is the growth in real output per worker per hour. This is the growth in real wages per hour. The diagonal line would be they both grow at exactly the same rate. So here you have Japan is right here in terms of output per hour. But you see, this is from 1995 to 2017 over this long period, more than two decades, virtually no growth in real wages per hour. Japan, well, a lot of countries Wages have not kept up with productivity, and that's a problem throughout the rich countries. Japan has got the worst case. So the things that have got to be done on that's on the demand side. I'm not going to talk about that. I'm going to talk about the supply side, which is what can an economy produce? What is its productivity? So the growth and output of any economy is a combination of two things. How many, how many people are working and how many hours, how fast does that grow? 
And then how much more does each worker produce in an hour? Now in Japan, because of aging, the actual number of working hours is about 10% lower than it was back in 1990s. So the only source of growth in the economy is productivity growth. That is each person producing more per hour. And what we see is that, unfortunately this goes only back to 1970, but if we'd be down here, if we were going back to say 1950, that productivity output per hour in Japan in 1970 was about 40% of the US level. The US level is 100%. And it kept catching up until the mid 1990s. And then it's fallen back down to 59%. Whereas in Europe, in the Eurozone, uh, which begins here, right, it's more or less remained flat. It should, have, should have grown better, but it has not dropped. So Japan has fallen back, not only vis a vis the United States, but also vis a vis Europe as well. So that brings us to, to why this productivity fallback. And I'm discuss one aspect of it because there's a bunch of reasons. But one of the basic ingredients for any economy is the economies that have more entrepreneurs, more people starting companies. And I don't mean just the sort of the Silicon Valley giant startup that gets venture capital and goes in the stock market and becomes Google. I mean the companies that are 50 people and then become 200. And, or 100 people become 1,000. And they're a tremendous source of fresh ideas and innovation, right? And company, countries, rather, that have more entrepreneurs grow faster than countries that don't. Industries that have more entrepreneurs tend to grow faster than those who don't. So one of the figures you're going to look at here is that in the United States, 60% of the growth in productivity during the 80s and 90s, came from new firms that were less than five years old. That's a stunning number. 60% of the entire growth in factory productivity from them. Big companies, on the other hand, which dominate Japan, tend to suffer the old economy disease, which is a country, a company rather, cannot be superb for decade after decade after decade. At some point, it just becomes merely good. And what we have in the case of, of Sony and other kinds of companies, that once excellent companies sort of fall back, they lack fresh ideas, they lack fresh blood, innovation. So in, in the 19, between two, 19, uh, oh, 2008 to 2020, at a time when demand for electronics goods was exploding, every single one of the top 10 electronics companies in Japan had a fall in their global sales whether they produced in Japan or overseas. So Japan's problem is a dearth of entrepreneurs. And uh, again, I'm not gonna oh, don't do that one. Okay. What you have in Japan is it has in the OECD the lowest share of entrepreneurs as part of the male labor force. I said the males because the gender discrimination in Japan is so bad it would sort of skew the numbers. But on average, a typical OECD country would have 6% of the male labor force creating companies with non-family employees. <clears throat> Japan has only got two and a half, right? So it's way, way behind, it's the least. And that's the problem. Moreover, even if you found a company, the question is, what is your ability to grow? Because there are all kinds of barriers in Japan that hurt the ability of a com company to grow, which we're gonna go through, and how those, some of those barriers are now falling. But here you have the, the column is how many employees when you start. And then 10 years later or more, how many employees do you have? And so Japan, you can see they've barely grown. The U.S. is off the charts on the other side. The U.S. is not the standard. The U.S. is an outlier as much as Japan on the other side. But here's the, here's the more typical companies, countries. So Japan has this dearth of entrepreneurs. So then the question is, why? Now, one of the explanations you'll commonly hear is its culture, that Japanese are inherently risk-averse, they're conformist. They all want to work for the same value security over taking the chance, blah, 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 blah. Uh, this is a fascinating topic, but basically it's simply not true. Or they should say it's greatly exaggerated. It's not 80% of the story. Maybe it's 10 or 15% of the story. If that were true, you could not explain the Meiji era, the rapid, rapid industrialization of the Meiji era which was fed by the creation of hundreds and thousands of new companies, 
or the high growth era of the 50s and 60s and early 70s, again, fed by entrepreneurship. So Japan has been entrepreneurial. And then there are particular reasons that we have to look at why. You can't sort of blame a culture. You can't just sort of put a, a sledgehammer of a cultural argument. Japan did it before. My view is it can do it again. Now, the good news is that some of these obstacles to entrepreneurship are disappearing or being overcome. The bad news is that some of them, the vital ones, are not being overcome. And the further bad news is that without government action to amplify some very positive trends, they, this, these positive trends may not reach critical mass. So we'll get into that. But first of all, one of the biggest obstacles is how do you recruit people? With the lifetime employment system, there's a huge risk in starting a company. In the US, you start a company and it fails. You, you go work for somebody else or you start another company, right? But you can get a second chance, a third chance. In the lifetime employment system, if you leave a big company, you'll never again get a job at a big company, certainly not in the same industry. You may have to become a non-regular worker where your wages are 30 or 50% lower than the regular worker. You also, uh, non-regular workers tend not to be able to get married because their, their pay is so low. Well, the good news is that that kind of situation is, is really that lifetime employment paralysis is really beginning to erode. Among the best and the brightest younger people in their 20s and 30s, a lot, not everybody, but among the best and the brightest among them, more and more will want, want to take a chance now on either starting a new company or going to work for a new company. And I've met them, and it's very, very inspiring. Women who cannot get promoted at traditional companies are flocking to these newer companies. You, you go in them and you see tons of women, and they are not serving tea. Right? Older people, people in their 40s, who their kids are out of school and they have business experience and all kinds of skills. And they are coming to these companies. Why? Because they hate their job. It's a boring job. And I talked to one guy who said, yeah, it's my first chance to do something interesting. It's my last chance, rather, in my, in my career to be finally do something interesting. We've got this thing. Japan's well, now he's second newest. When I wrote this, he was the newest. Now he's the second newest. He's put together a website to, to match 20,000 companies that need workers with people who want to switch jobs. In 2023, 2.3 million work employees, which are fairly high paying in Japan, these employees that they seek out, found jobs at these other companies. So that means that companies which used to not even be able to hire the staff they need now can. Now can. That was one of the two biggest obstacles that companies said why they couldn't grow or why they couldn't start a company. The second thing is the power of technology. Technology, people underestimate the political power of technology is changing social conditions. Someone has to, wants to ask me about the transistor radio and Elvis Presley, I'll talk about it, but we won't do it right now. But he was the killer app for the transistor radio, and the transistor radio made him possible. But here you have a situation where the, the big giant firms in Japan have are still living in the analog mindset. When the leading edge of innovation was big, vertically integrated companies, you know, 25,000 or more companies, they did most of the R&D, they did everything in-house, they did not collaborate with others. Right? And that's still true of some companies like autos. But in the digital era, more and more industries from electronics to pharmaceuticals, it's entrepreneurs, newer companies that are leading innovation. More and more of the R&D is done by these smaller companies of only 1,000 staffers or 500 or even 100. If I asked you who invented the Pfizer vaccine for COVID, you might say Pfizer. It was not Pfizer. It was a biotech firm called BioNTech. That is a German startup that was founded by a married couple who are immigrants from Turkey. So it's not only a technology story, an entrepreneurial story, it's a globalization story. But among the giants in Japan, they've not moved. They're still stuck in old ideas. So out of 64 companies, 64 countries rather, that were ranked in terms of what was called digital agility, that is how much of an increase in sales or profits do they make by employing digital technology to really change what the firm could do, new products, better products, et cetera. 
Out of 64 countries, Japan came in 64th, which is unbelievable considering you know, the achievements of Japan in education, how they do on math and science and international tests. It has to do with the way firms are run, the lack of competition, the lack of entrepreneurship. So what's changing? And by the way, part of this is all countries subsidize R&D, otherwise there would not be enough. But in Japan, 90% of the government financial aid to R&D goes to the big firms, which are flooded with cash. They don't need the money, but the small firms that really need it don't get it. As a result, this is the firms with less than 250 workers. And so you'll see in Italy, and UK, and France, less than 30% of R&D is done by them with less than 500 workers. In Japan, it's only 7%. And that's one of the reasons for the lack of innovation. But technology can change things. For, so, for example, it's now, depending on who you ask, it could be 20% of a car is software, and electronics, and hardware that goes with it. Players group companies don't know how to do it in-house. So they had to hire new companies, outsiders. There are now more first-tier Toyota suppliers who are software vendors rather than hardware suppliers. And these companies want to remain independent. <clears throat> They do not join the Toyota group. They want to be able to sell to any company they want to or partner with them, not just sell, but collaborate, even Toyota's competitors. And Toyota has to accept that because its political power, its market power has declined because it doesn't know how to master technology, which is vital for competitiveness. And therefore, one of the other problems that entrepreneurs had, startups had, is who do you sell to? Who what big companies didn't want to buy from them? Now they have to but they can also have access to consumers they didn't have before. Before the distribution system <clears throat> meant that consumers would not even know about their product. Now with e-commerce, they have access to millions and millions of customers they didn't before. So on Rakuten alone, 57,000 SMEs last year had sales of 5.7 trillion yen to just millions and millions of customers. But that has changed as a, re as a result some of these companies have grown tenfold, 20-fold, in some cases, even 100-fold. Well, that's pretty unusual. But the point is technology is breaking down this closed market, rigid market system. So labor market and the and services and goods market to sell, barriers are coming down. Uh, Globalization is interesting. I'm not going to do it in this good time. But just say this. Almost all the entrepreneurs I met, and this is true of other people as well, Almost all of them have some experience with a foreign country. Either they've studied overseas, or they've worked overseas, or they've worked for a foreign company in Japan. Why is this important? Because they have different, different countries have different ideas. And so you learn there's more fluidity. One guy I met, he developed this tremendous product, and he started his own company. He was an agronomist by profession. He figured he was going to develop something, sell it to a big company, but because he went to Stanford, People who met said, oh, start your own company to do it. He did. And now this company has got hundreds of millions of dollars in sales. About 300 million on its way, on its way to a billion. So the biggest remaining roadblock are twofold. One is finance, which is that unless you get finance, you can't grow. And, and therefore, you, you, the angel funds, which are companies, uh, funds that finance people who will never get venture capital money, they're smaller, they're younger. They're very rare in Japan, so people can't get financed that way. Uh, the banks are reluctant to lend to companies, even if they're around for 20 years with a good track record. In fact, the banks will charge a higher interest rate to a 10-year-old company with a good credit rating than to a 50-year-old company with a poor credit rating that they've known for decades. And all kinds of barriers. What happens is two things. One is Unless you start off big enough, you can grow fast enough, you're never going to make it. Either you'll die or you won't grow at all. And the second thing is then, who gets to found a company? If you don't have access to credit or, or equity investment, it's the rich people with brains and talent and ambition. Right? Who doesn't get to found a company? It's the people with lots of brains and talent and ambition, but no money. So some of them go to Singapore where they can get money. But the point is you're locking out. And that's one of the reasons we saw in the chart, only two and a half percent in Japan. So finance is a big deal. The other big deal is the government, which is that 
there are these positive trends I mentioned, but they need to be amplified by the government. One thing I mentioned, R&D. Why aren't they giving more of the R&D aid to these innovative entrepreneurial companies instead of these large companies who don't need it? People have to know if they take a chance on a new company, and most of them fail everywhere, that they can get a good job again. Well, Japan is very unequal in its pay between regular and non-regular workers. 40% of the labor force is now non-regular workers whose pay, as I mentioned, about 50% lower than, than the regular worker. So if you go to work for a good company and you it fails, you need a job, you may never get a regular job again. Japanese law says equal pay for equal work, but the law is not enforced. France has the same law, they enforce it. And as a result, there's no wage gap between the regular and non-regular workers in France. There is in Japan. What they need to do is enforce the law. I'm not one of those people who believes, you know, if the government lets, lets the market operate by itself and just give no help to channel it, that things will be all okay. No, there, there are things the government needs to do. It won't do it. He should have talked big about 100,000 startups by 2027. He did almost nothing to, to, to uh, change reality. He changed rhetoric. He didn't change reality. He had this angel tax, which is very, very poorly designed. It won't work. There's a similar angel tax credit in France, which they could have adopted in Japan. That has worked tremendously. Why didn't Japan do it? If I were a conspiracy theorist, I, which I'm not, I would say, well, they didn't want it to work. But I think it's more complicated than that, in fact. But the point is, it's set up to think about defending the big incumbents and the small zombie incumbents. Like, keep them alive. It's not designed to think about supporting entrepreneurs except in rhetoric. But I think the political situation can change uh, in the last chart, which is this, that not only is these trends, the labor market is changing by itself without the government doing anything, just by generational change. The technology is changing this market for labor and, and customer access. But <clears throat> you know the future does not vote. Innovation, new companies, they're the future. The future does not vote. The future does not buy tickets to LDP parties and dinners. But as there are more and more entrepreneurs, suddenly the future becomes the present and they gain weight. And some of them have got thousands or tens of thousands of employees. They get access to the bureaucrats. They get access to politicians. And there are bureaucrats and politicians who really want to see Japan recover and want to do things. And I met a number of them, people who try to change this all sorts of things, uh, this angel tax and other sorts of things. The other thing is the risk to the LDP. The reason why the LDP is still in power, as far as I know, it's the only advanced country where it's still a one-party democracy. And one-party states don't work in this modern era. You need, as much as you need competition in business, you need it in politics. But why does the LDP rule? It's not because people like the LDP. It's because people who don't like it don't vote. Their hopes were raised by the Democratic Party of Japan. They came out and flocked to vote, and they turned out the LDP in a landslide election in 2009. They didn't perform well. And three years later, they were turned out of power. The LDP came back in a landslide victory. But in that landslide victory, the LDP in 2012 actually got fewer votes than it had gotten when it lost in 2009. The reason the LDP is in power is that turnout keeps falling and falling and falling. And so those who are organized come out to vote. And that's why the LDP remains in power. If the opposition could actually give people a reason to vote for it, if they haven't, then we might, as they did in 209, they gave a promise they didn't fulfill. But if they could do it, the LDP has to fear that it could be tossed out of power. Therefore, it needs to do something to help the economy revive. And, and we've, heard, we've heard four times that Japan is back. We were told in the 1990s under Prime Minister Hashimoto, Japan is back. And The Economist had a cover story with him in Superman costume on the cover. Under Koizumi, we were told Japan is back. All this reform going on. Under Abe, we were, Abe Namis, we were told Japan is back. Now it's Kishida's turn. This has been going on for decades. One is Japan has to really come back or else the LDP has to fear moving back. So there are all sorts of political reasons why the situation may change. It's a contest, as I say, between those forces, not just 
people as forces, but, but trends, generational attitudes, technology, globalization, uh, gender equality, other sorts of trends that are pushing in the right direction. There's a contest between those forces and the forces that want to defend the status quo. But even those forces are in trouble. If Toyota needs entrepreneurs. Is it pro-entrepreneurship or anti? They're conflicted. And that's another part of it. So there's, there's, I think Japan today has the greatest opportunity for recovery it's had in a generation. Unfortunately, Japan has a habit of missing opportunities, but this is the best it's had. It would be a really shame if it missed it. I don't know what the outcome is going to be, but there is this real contest that there hasn't been before. And the chances that the forces of progress could actually win this thing, I think, are greater than it's been. So I remain hopeful that that will happen. So let me stop there and let's have a talk. Thank you. An incredible amount of material. In is that 30 minutes? I think it was. Okay, here we go. We have questions. I'll start off with Yuta Ueda from the Ministry of Economy, Trade and Industry, who is one of our associates visiting. And while he's here at Harvard for the year, he's doing research on industrial policy and economic security, looking at supply chain. Oh, okay. Thank you very much for your presentation. I'm Yuta Ueda, associate of the Relations. And today I'm very interested in your presentation. I've been pleased to uh, discuss this on topic with you. And I have several questions to you, but you do short QA session. So in this time, I would like to ask you one question. Uh, I'd like to ask you a question about corporate metabolism. Uh, you mentioned in this book that Japan should promote competition and uh, it leads to the existence of exit of zombie company and uh, entry of productive ventures. Uh, I agree with the opinion. However, previous some previous uh, research studies uh, show have shown that the productivity of existing firms in Japan is relatively high, and that of entering firms and its growth rate uh, relatively low. And it leads to the assumption that uh, the corporate uh, metabolism may not contribute to increasing Japanese productivity, although. Uh, generally, uh, <laughs> uh, competition and metabolism improve productivity. So uh, these results may have been, uh, have been analyzed due to the failure of management succession and low growth rate of top productive funds. How do you think Japanese government and economy can change current bad metabolism to the good one? Okay. Um... Well, first of all, I'd like to see those reports, but it contradicts most of the data that I've seen. Um, the, and that what happens in Japan is when you have a new successful uh, firm, the, the really the high growth SMEs have a nickname, they're called gazelles after the African antelope because they're very fast, they're very, very agile. And there's about four or 5% of them that are really these high growth, of all SMEs, they're really new, new SMEs, these high growth companies. And their productivity is actually significantly higher than the existing companies in their, in their industry. So, but what does happen, and maybe this is what you're referring to, because Japan is protecting the zombies, uh, Fukawa Sensei has shown this data, and others have the same thing, that the firms that leave an industry are forced out of the industry because they're, medi they're, they're mediocre. They're not bad, they're mediocre. But the zombies are protected with you know, loans they shouldn't get, and credit guarantees and all sorts of stuff. That the firms that are forced out actually have higher productivities than the zombies that remain. So, which is the opposite in most countries, which is the firms that are forced out have lower productivity. But among entering firms, uh, there's just no question in the data that that the the new entrance of people who hire non-family employees is higher uh, than the than the incumbents. Um, as far so that a greater metabolism, by which people mean in Japan, only uh, four or five percent of the number of existing firms either enter. There was new companies entering. Are say four or five percent of the number of those who are still there. 
or five, four or five percent leave. It's about half of what it is in a typical country. And so you have to speed up the momentum. One of the things is you could do, uh, one, I mentioned the R&D. A second thing is most governments have a set aside for newer companies. Japan doesn't really. Japan has, a, when the government purchases are about 20% of GDP. So the government were buying stuff from newer innovative companies. And not just desk, desk, you know, pencils for schools and like that. That would give them revenue. It would mean they would have more, the banks would be more willing to lend them money. So in 2015, the government did create this set aside and they set a goal that 1% of all procurement should be for these newer companies. Whereas for smaller companies, I forget the number, but it's way in the high double digits. Could be 30 or 40 percent i forget the exact number but it's, so one percent is nothing and the government never even met that goal then in 2018 they said oh let's change it to a higher goal let's make it three percent well they didn't meet that one either and one of the things when kishida said he's going to promote entrepreneurs one of the recommendations there was people who produced a superb report that kishida ignored one of the things is raise the goal to 10 percent, but really do the things you need to do to, to meet it they didn't do that. There are various kinds of tax breaks for people who invest in startups. They didn't do that. So, um, you know, the point is there, it's not rocket scientists. There are experts in Japan who know exactly what should be done. They're often on these advisory committees, but then, and, and some of your colleagues are really behind, like Ishizan, are really, really behind these ideas. But when it goes through the whole inter-ministry discussion, whatever, and the political discussion, they're not done. So I think, you know, the recipe is known. It could be done. It just needs political will. It's hard for governments to fund creative destruction. You, know, you give taxpayer money and the company fails. So that tendency to pick winners by going with older established mm -hmm. firms is a natural bureaucratic tendency. What would be the way to get government to be willing to throw money into... Well, the government threw money at this really obscure company, which has now done very well. It's called Tesla. Tesla's start was because of government money. You know, Japan, most governments actually have programs to try to do that. Now, I agree there is a political opposition there, which is the, the incumbents who might be thrown out of the market resist that sort of thing. There's also propaganda about you wasting government money. But the point is, the private financial market is not geared to, to for very long-term things or things that seem risky. But if you look at Japan, three of the technologies which are essential to fighting global warming were pioneered in Japan with government money. One is solar power cells, which was not invented in Japan, but turning into a commercial product was done by METI's Sunshine Project. The second thing is electric vehicles, which was also pioneered by METI, beginning of the 1970s and 1980s. Banks are gonna do a 40 or bond market, a 40 year project, right? And the other was lithium ion batteries, which, initially, which are now used in cell phones and battery storage for, for um, renewable energy, et cetera all developed in Japan with government money. So yes, it, 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 I understand and agree with you that there are obstacles. I think the political obstacles are bigger in Japan. And part of the reason is because it's a one party state tied to the incumbents. So it's politically hard, but it's harder in Japan often than elsewhere and harder than it need be. There's no reason why, for example, who the hell is gonna even know except for someone like me, that Japan shifted this R&D money to other companies. But the recipients will know, and I'll know, and Toyota may say, if we need people that we need to partner with, wouldn't it be better to fund them so we have people to partner with, but not too much, because we don't want people going to challenge us. So it gets very, very complicated. All right, we have many more questions, both online and in the room. So I'll ask everyone to be short with their questions and to introduce themselves. I'll try to be shorter with my hand, please. 
Hi, I'm Kenya Amano. I'm postdoc fellow at the US Japan Relations. I have two questions. First one is uh, Bank of Japan may increase the rate tomorrow. And that what is the implication of the having the normal interest rates? Because like in you know, a one way to think about it is the low easy money could nurture the zombie companies to easy to access credit. Well, where it's like, you know, as you mentioned, like, you know, that kind of prevent to have many startups to access to the credit. So what's the implication on that? The kind of having, let's say 2% interest rate. And the second question is, as you mentioned, uh, you keep mentioning of the finance for, by the government, but I, I'm also interested in the regulation by the government, because like, if you look at the discussion on the Uber, um, Japan has a huge, like, you know, um, regulatory barrier to enter that kind of the new technologies. Mm -hmm. So uh, what prevent um, the government to release that kind of regulations? What do you think, like what, what are the politics behind that? Sure. Um, on the Bank of Japan, I don't think Japan is gonna be, no, Bank of Japan will not normalize interest rates. Mm -hmm. They're gonna take a, an interest rate on reserves that was minus 0.1%. Mm -hmm and move it to 0% or 0 0.1. They may get rid of this thing that's called the yield, the yield control. But they're not gonna, uh, Uchida, the deputy governor gave a talk. It doesn't mean they're gonna go to no, let the market decide. They're gonna still prevent interest rates from rising. Mm -hmm. So 2%, certainly they're not gonna move toward 2% overnight money, a policy rate. Mm -hmm. um, and it's because of the supply demand situation of finance, it may not even get to 2%, the longer term rate. So I don't know where it's gonna go, but this is like another one of these minor incremental tweaks that the pan is trying to do to get back to normalization, but it's, this is a longer process. But I want to see what they do. Um, but I do agree with your point that when money costs nothing, it often is invested in companies that shouldn't, shouldn't be getting money. Um, uh, on the regulatory side, <clears throat> I think there are cases where regulations do hobble um, new new companies, you know, like Uber. Uh, we had a, there was a big big controversy about online sales of pharmaceuticals, and this is always almost always it's the protection of some interest group. And in, in the case of the Uber, it's the it's the taxi drivers. Having been a taxi driver in college, I'm all for protectionism and not market values in the taxi industry. But that's an exception to my general market attitude um, <clears throat> um there you know and, and there are other cases but i do think of all the obstacles that need to be overcome while regulation is important i think finance is more important mm -hmm. but there's no reason you can't do both at the same time it's the same political attitude mm -hmm. which causes which causes problems and mm -hmm. one, one, one quick thing why do they support all these zombies because japan didn't back in the high growth era did not need a government run safety net. You had full employment, you had high growth, you had equal distribution of income, you had labor fluidity so people could get new jobs as older companies fail. And so there was very, very much one of the most equal distributions of income among all rich countries, security, income, et cetera. But when you entered the low growth era, that began to dissolve and the government should have created an overt government finance social safety net. They didn't. So what they began to say is your job at your current company is your safety net. In fact, when the company should downsize by 10%, we'll give it subsidies to keep all the workers on. And so that the reason they have to support all these zombie small mom and pop shops is has to do with it, it's the disguised form of really welfare. And so there's a political impetus behind it. So to get rid of that, you have to do other things at the same time. I'm here online. Uh, yes. Uh, uh, I'm Tomohiro Ueda with USJP program here. And uh, from your insightful presentation, uh, I understand finance and governance uh, play an important role in uh, enhancing the entrepreneurs. And now, uh, Tohoku University will be selected to 10, uh, 10 trillion yen fund project, and uh, Kishida cabinet takes uh, initiative to establish a uh, global startup campus uh, with MIT in Tokyo. So uh, I was just wondering uh, what are, what are uh, key, key elements 
uh, of this national fund and uh, uh, this uh, initiative? And uh, do you think uh, these will work successfully? I don't know yet. I haven't studied it. I've read a few things, their opinions, because I'm too busy writing this when it came about. Um, their opinions back and forth of those who say, you know, it will really help and those who say it doesn't. Um, it's not as if the government is opposed to entrepreneurship, you know, but it's it's like low on their priority list. But they often, the problem is they sometimes get very gimmicky and they think, oh, if you just give a university money, it will create spinoffs and those will be startups. They also sort of look for the glamour. They look for the Silicon Valley type things or unicorns when it's much more pedestrian stuff. Uh, one of the problems of people using digital technology, for example, is they don't know what it will do for their company, some of SMEs. And so the government, people are talking about, let's train everybody in, in artificial intelligence. That's like saying, why don't you run the track in the Olympics when you're not, you're not even walking yet? You know, they go for the glamour. And so I don't know if this is a, it could be a very, very worthwhile and helpful program that will really do a lot of good. Or it could just be another one of these sort of gimmicks that that fails, or something in between. So I don't know. I, I but you know, hopefully it will be you know helpful. But I just don't know. I'm sorry. Let me turn to two online questions. Robert Tawe asks about what is the role of local politics to create an ecosystem. He comments that in Boston, the entrepreneurial ecosystem has very much been local government and university. And do you see this happening at the county province level in Japan? Second question, what about the international side? Um, to what extent is uh, there funding from venture capital outside of Japan? And what is the role of the Japanese government to support or prevent such contracts? Okay. Um, oh God, my brain is going, tell me. The first question is about what's the local level policy? Oh, is there you know going to be a Boston ecosystem in Kobe? <laughs> you know what? Um, there are various local governments trying to do stuff. Uh, I think Fukuoka was supposed to be one of the big, the big success stories. Um, and again, you know, because you can't study every aspect of it. I haven't studied because there are now people wondering if sort of it's it's fizzling. It's not as spectacular as it had been. I don't know if that's true. There's all kinds of interesting stuff going on in Kyoto. I mean, the difference between Kyoto and Tokyo is a fascinating thing in this regard that I've been talked about, but I didn't have a chance to research it. But I know there are, there are local governments trying to do things. One, for example, is simply procurement. So a lot of the procurement is done by the national government, but quite a lot is also done by local governments. So that's one thing that they could do. They could have set asides for, for, newer, for newer companies. Um, there are various things that, that Governor Kohei was trying to do and um, oh, sorry, my, my brain is going today. Oh, an allergy is hit my brain. Um, anyway, the, the, to figure out local regulations, local tax things, uh, yes. getting offices are expensive. So I think there are things that local governments could do, but in Japan, the, the power of local governments vis a the national is not as large as it is, so I think most of it will have to be done by the the national by the national government. Um, the second question was international, international venture capital. Yeah, well, you know, the problem is that there there are cases of it coming in, but the same things that lead to the barriers of growth that you saw on the charts um, also mean that the returns to vent, to well venture capital. I need to repeat this, venture capital is only a small slice of the overall entrepreneurial market. In Silicon Valley, there are 2,000 high-tech companies funded by venture capital. In America as a whole, there are 50,000 of these so-called gazelles, almost none of which are on the stock market. So, so it's, it's more than venture capital. It's also these angel funds, it's other sorts of things of, of that type. Um, but the problem I spoke to, uh, American venture capitalist who is saying the problem is that the returns in Japan are very, very low. Um, and so that we'd love to invest more in Japan, but are we supposed to, we really want to, 
uh, but we need to make be able to also make money and if there are other opportunities elsewhere. So it becomes kind of a, a vicious cycle, which is they don't the returns are low, so they don't fund it. And because they don't fund it, you know, not enough people start it. And often Japanese venture capital firms will tell a venture, a, a new venture firm, go on the stock market, go on the mother's market after only four or five years, which is way too soon. They need years and years to be able to build up to a critical size. And now they have to start earning quarterly profits and all kinds of stuff. So they, they don't get to reach that critical mass they need to really be able to take off. And so the it's one of these problems that would you, you know, you've got eight factors, A, B, C, D, E, F, and G, and you can't just sort of change one and have it work. You've got to also change the other ones at the same time. That's one of the obstacles that no one sort of intends, but just is part of the situation. But so you see people are moving in. I think the first step is people actually moving to the private equity market when big companies hive off divisions. I would say one other thing the government could do, there are 600,000 good small and medium companies which are likely to go with millions of workers who may go out of business in the next 10 or 15 years. Medi has warned about this because they have a, a chief CEO who's 70 years old and his children don't want to take over the firm. His, his factory manager can't take it over because the banks have this thing called a personal guarantee, which makes it very risky. So one thing is foreigners would like to be able to come in and buy up some of these healthy companies. It would help their global market share. These are good companies. Um, Jetro has no, no mandate, in fact, the opposite of a mandate, to recruit these people. They only can recruit people who want to start up new companies. There was a preliminary report advising the cabinet to for Jetro to go out and recruit these international companies to do a merger and acquisition with these companies threatened with succession. That was removed from the final report. We don't know by who, people won't tell me. But the point is people clearly, some people clearly thought it was scarier to have foreigners buy these Japanese SMEs than for these Japanese as good productive SMEs to fail and millions of workers on the street. I mean, there's a real problem politically here. So there's all kinds of ways in which internationalization would really help Japan a lot. Good questions? Yes. Yeah. Um, so yeah. Yeah, uh, thank you for the presentation. Um, uh, uh, personally, I was impressed today. Uh, impressed because uh, every point you talk, you know, touched upon sounded very pertinent, and uh, I had some personal feeling. Um, uh, uh, which I had uh, something like 20 something years ago when I first time, you know, uh, the first time I read the day, uh, a book by Carol von uh, Wolfram <laughs> at that time. He was hated by everyone, but I saw that at that time that it was the, um, uh, the person who <laughs> said what other people uh, wouldn't. And uh, my question is that, well, one is a, 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 a small question about the about this angel funds. So um, uh, you uh, recommend that the government uh, make the relevant uh, tax, you know, or tax exemption scheme um, uh, uh, for the people to, you know, invest in the an angel fund. The, the but uh, as of now. There is very scarce angel fund uh, still in Japan. So, do you think that if the government takes this step, the angel fund would be, you know, formed afterwards because of that incentive? Do you think so, or are there, uh, you know, or some other challenges for the formation of uh, such angel fund? Uh, the second question is a rather big and the big one since you mentioned that. You know, uh, from Hashimoto, uh, Koizumi, Abe, everyone said that Japan was Japan's back. Uh, but um, uh, I feel that you uh, now think that Japan uh, was not back at that time. So uh, am I correctly understanding it that way? Oh, and um, do you think uh, if this contest uh, can strike in future um, a better, uh, for example, the be better balance of the entrepreneurs and the big firms, then the Japan can, can be back. Is that um, what you mean? 
Yes, absolutely. <clears throat> so let me just answer that first because it's simpler. Yes, Japan's not back, has not come back, mm -hmm. is still not back, mm -hmm. but it could be back. Mm -hmm. with the right, but, and, and yes, every country needs both entrepreneurs and the big giants. Mm -hmm. It's not one or the other. It needs the proper balance. Japan is skewed too much toward the big giant companies and toward the zombies. It really needs fewer zombies, more entrepreneurs. Um, on the angel funds, well, one of the interesting things is to compare Japan to France. People often you know, sort of want to compare Japan to the U.S., but the U.S. is not actually necessarily the best model for Japan. So France was similar to Japan. It was regarded as very, very anti-entrepreneurial. <clears throat> In fact, um, <clears throat> yeah, lots of good giants, but very few entrepreneurs. And the French government, president, prime minister realized, and, and bureaucrats, that you know, France would really fall behind unless it, it did this in the digital era. And so they created an angel tax. And the way it works is that, first of all, an angel, again, this is not venture capital, which funds companies that are going to go on the stock market and have gigantic returns. These are smaller companies of 50, 200, 500 that can grow five or tenfold, and they'll never be on the stock market. And you need them. You need this whole wide variety. So what they did is they, they, they had middle-class people could invest, a couple could invest up to $24,000 in an angel fund. And the angel fund itself would have you know, maybe 20 or 30 or 40 companies at any given time. And so they could invest in them. Well, billions, because, you know, the French have this unique culture. They don't like to pay taxes. It's very, very unique. Mm -hmm. but, um, but I think in Japan also, you may have this kind of culture. And so billions of dollars flooded in. And as a result, they created 38,000 startups, about 2,500 of them on what's called deep tech, which is profound innovations in technology and science. They were worth about all combined about $10 billion in 2010. Now they're worth $300 billion and are growing. They have 26 unicorns. If you looked at the amount of VC money in, in France and Japan, say 20 years ago or 15 years ago, is very similar. Now France has moved ahead. Mm -hmm. So what prevented it in Japan? What's the difference? Because Japan created, Kishina created what he called an angel tax. Well, in France, you had to invest in a fund. And it's like investing in a mutual fund. The fact is most of the companies the funds invest in fail. The vast majority fail. But the funds as a whole, the winners win so well that people can take their, their $24,000 and five years later, it could be worth five, six, seven times as much as what they invested. In Japan, the government said, you have to invest not in a fund, but in an individual company. Why would anybody do this? If the experts get it wrong most of the time, why would an ordinary person, they have no idea which company to invest in. Worse yet, and this gets into your regulatory issue, you know, if, to do the research on small firms, it's very, very labor intensive. It's very, very expensive. So you need enough investment to make it worth your while. In France, you could have, th and the U.S. and other places, you could have thousands and thousands of what's called limited partners that is investors in these funds. In Japan, for reasons that seem to make sense at the time, but, but not really, the limited part, they can only have 49 limited partners. Therefore, you don't get enough money to make it worthwhile to do these kinds of investments. These are two very, very simple changes that they could make. They, when Kishino was doing this thing, there were people working on it. I personally wrote an article comparing Japan to France on this. And I have a lawyer friend who sent it to Miyazawa, who's the head of the LDP Tax Commission. Never got a response, but there was time to change the, just a small tweak. They couldn't do it. I knew bureaucrats in the cabinet office who were trying to get that change. They couldn't do it because the finance ministry said, well, we don't want to give away a tax break because if we give it to them, then this will people ask for it, those people ask for it. Yes, but the money, you'll gain much more revenue than you lose. Yes, yes, but we don't care because then other people will want it too. <clears throat> it's this ideological and inertia kind of thing. It, it's, 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 I don't know to laugh or to cry because it's a tragedy that Japan could be so much better off than it is. Not with a gigantic change, but with a number of these small changes that add up to, to, a, to a big change, a snowball effect. So it's just, you know, it makes you angry. This could be done, and yet it's not. What you need is, as the 
entrepreneurs gain more weight, gain more clout, they can go to the bureaucrats. They can go to people say, this time, let's make a fight over it. Let's change this thing. Mikitani does it on this farm, online pharmaceuticals, but it could be done elsewhere too. Thank you so very much. That was fantastic. And there's some ongoing questions that look at the employment practices. And you mentioned the challenge of lifetime employment and incentives. And I wonder if you wanted to just make some closing remarks on that, as uh, there were a couple of questions about that online. Sure. The, the, the thing is what I said before, which is the lifetime employment, when it was developed in the 20th century, this is not a cultural thing stemming from Shitoku you know, in the sixth century. This is a 20th century invention, which made sense at the time. It benefited Japan at the time. That was a different situation. The current situation, the, the, the downside is bigger than the upside of it. But people cannot leave the company without taking a huge risk of, will they get another job? Will it be a good job? And all kinds of changes have made it even worse. You're, your benefits, your lump sum pain, you know, your lump sum retirement benefit is, is bigger, bigger if you stay there. Your unemployment compensation is bigger if you stay. All kinds of, 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 of hindrances. But nonetheless, so a lot of young people have become more conservative than ever because of this. Uh, and they don't travel abroad because it won't help their promotion. They don't study overseas. But there's a small percentage, it could be five or 10%, who are much more willing to take this chance more and more with every passing year. It used to be, you wouldn't find graduates of Todai and Keio and Wasida among the list of entrepreneurs. Now they're there and I've met them. You'd find that uh, a lot of the new companies on the stock market, about half of them were former employees of Rakuten or Recruit, which got tens of thousands of employees and they don't quite encourage their employees to leave and start a new company. But if they do, it's okay. And if they fail, they can sometimes come back. And so they create a breeding ground for new people. So there are trends in society. But as I said, what you need to do is reduce the risk. The, the benefits for succeeding are too small and the risk for failing are way, way, way too big. In Japan, the bankruptcy system is horrible. And so what you need is changing it. And the first step is there's a law that says you cannot discriminate on pay and promotion between men and women and between regulars and non-regulars, enforce the law. Have the Ministry of Labor, Labor inspectors, they got thousands of them, when they inspect things, they do not inspect this because they consider it a contract issue, not a violation of law issue. The prime minister, with a stroke of the pen, can say, do it. Doesn't even need a diet law. It could be done. They don't do it. Because the big companies don't want it, or even the small companies, they don't want to pay. They want these low paid workers. And unfortunately, a lot of the full-time workers also like these low-paid workers so they can be laid off in bad times and then their own job will be more secure. Or the company make more profit since their bonus is bigger. So it becomes a very, changing it is administratively easy, politically, unfortunately, hard. Thing we're talking about. Well, that's where your book is so important and I hope many will be reading it. You really are able to bring in political insight and an understanding of the whole social system, labor constraints and the need for getting the right personnel and the right funding opportunities. And all of this comes together in a really great book. Thank, Thank you, you for sharing it. And I hope that we all can continue the conversation and learn more from reading. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Oxford is offering a discount. It's cheaper than Amazon when you bring it. So, um, I should I'll, I'll send you the flyer. <laughs> All right. Okay. Should... And the code you need to put in. So if you want to do it, do it. The discount is on the hot cover. Not, uh... Yes. <laughs>